Hi, I'm Pastor Neil Darian with the Chai Lai Crossroads Bible Church. We've had an RU program here at our church for three years. We missed one night out of three years because the roads were all flooded and we couldn't get to the church. But I am really excited and honored to get to share in this program. And my title is, When the Going Gets Tough, the Tough Get Going. So what happened during RU with COVID? Well, we did what a lot of people did. For 10 weeks, we shut down everything, but we streamed every day. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, and I'm excited to do that. But let me share a little bit of background and, and share with you uh, kind of where I'm coming from. My older brother died of a cocaine overdose on December 19, 2003. So I grew up in a home where drugs were uh, commonly used. My brothers used them. My parents didn't. And uh, so drugs and alcohol were a part of what I was accustomed to being around. When I was seven years old, my older brother, who was 17, uh, that died of the cocaine overdose, 10 years older than me, um, was supposed to be babysitting me on Saturdays, and we would come up with an elaborate story of what we were doing, but what we were really doing is taking care of his pot plants. He had marijuana patches spread over three or four counties, and so I would carry the backpack with the fertilizer and the seven dust, and he had a problem with the nematodes, and so uh, we were always trying to find ways to make his plants grow better. What blew me away is that driving around as a kid with my parents or with other people, I could spot his patches from U.S. or state highways. I saw them, and it was as if nobody else could see them. So it grieves me to admit to you that he was the dealer for the local community in Arkansas where I grew up. So I saw him ruin a lot of lives. He also had cash in his pocket, so that was nice as a kid. We could, he could buy me a lot of candy. But it kind of blew my mind to realize that instead of buying candy, even with a lot of cash in his pocket, he would rather steal it because he just thought he was smarter than the average bear and was entitled or whatever it is that people are thinking. I think they're just not thinking. But I have a special heart for working with people who are going through addiction because I've been in it. So I kind of put myself in the position of what would I want for my brother? I mean, a reason we, one of the reasons we started the program is uh, basically everybody in the world is my cousin. My brother is dead, but Adam and Eve are everybody's parents. And so everybody's my cousin. They're still family to help. Maybe they haven't trusted Christ, but biologically they are family. They're still my cousins. And so we really want to help them. And I know I'm so proud of all of you guys for having an RU program, for putting yourself out there, for spending a lot of money. I mean, right now I'm recording this as our bus is out picking up people for our RU program. I'm really excited about that. It's going to come back with people and, and our RU program is going to get kicked off tonight, Friday night. But I just want to tell you uh, what happened over time was my brother's addictions worsened. And I got a call. I was in southern Illinois uh, doing some work, and I got a call that my brother was on life support that he'd overdosed. And so I uh, flew home to Chicago. That's where I lived at the time. Hopped on a plane from O'Hare, flew to New York City, uh, rented the cheapest possible car, but they didn't have it. So they gave me a soft top Mustang in December when the roads were bad, rear wheel drive, but it was a brand new car. It was kind of cool. It didn't have to pay more for it. But when I went to the hospital and saw my brother's body on life support and his chest is going up and down and his hands are still warm, his body is still warm, you could open his eyes, but he wasn't there. I just, I cried. I cried and I thought, what an incredible waste and what an incredible loss. And I resolved to try to do whatever I possibly could to help people who were struggling through the same kind of thing. And so uh, my sister-in-law, I, I will finish that story with my sister-in-law at the end of this time. But what I want to share with you is what we did and what probably many of us have already gone to do because of COVID. At the time, it was kind of unusual for us. What we did um, when COVID hit, here's what we did. We grabbed uh, just, uh, this is on a little bitty stand and an iPhone. 
I would go live uh, every morning and every night. And here's what was amazing. The county counted those as meetings because they weren't having meetings at all. And uh, as COVID has continued in, in the latter part of 2020, the county is now doing the same thing again with our RU program on Friday nights, we're streaming it. But they also consider, I do a daily devotional every day on my personal page, facebook.com slash Neil Darian at 10 a.m. Eastern. And if people watch that and comment live, then that also counts as a meeting for them. So we're trying to find ways to come alongside the people that are struggling in our community. And as you know, everybody that is court ordered to go to a meeting is really happy to have an opportunity to go to a meeting. And so uh, being able to do it online during COVID has been a really helpful thing. So we actually did an RU meeting though for 45 minutes every night for months when COVID first started. Because what we realized was that these Bible verses are absolutely true. Proverbs 3.27, let me share that with you. With an, withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. So what could we do? Well, we, could, we couldn't get our bus and go get anybody, but we could certainly stream. And so uh, when COVID first hit, we were actually in Illinois. My, my church is in Ohio. Uh, and then we wound up going to Florida. And so wherever we were, I just made sure that at 6 o'clock every night, uh, weeknights, Sunday nights, every night, we did a, a meeting. And every day at 10 o'clock, we did a meeting. And so that was, I think, helpful in the community. And so we turned something that Satan meant for evil, we turned it into something that was good. And so I'm not telling you anything that you haven't already thought of. Probably many of you guys are doing this. But it was helpful to our people, and what was neat is it helped us build a stronger online community. And then once we were able to meet again, a lot of those people came out uh, for the first time to meet us in person. And uh, some of them have continued in the RU program. And as you know, with RU, as with anything in ministry, you don't keep everybody that comes through the doors. But what I will tell you is that there were people who trusted Christ during those times of streaming. And it was really wonderful to interact with people, to encourage them, to get to know them better. And so uh, I'm really happy that we had the opportunity to do that. And so I would strongly encourage you, if you haven't uh, considered doing that, uh, all you need maybe is just an iPhone. A lot of times I'll use uh, my earbuds just to make the audio a little bit better. I have uh, a little wired cable for a microphone that I often use to make the audio better. Um, so that's a cheap and easy way. I'm happy to help any of you if you want to figure out how to start doing that. Um, and and it's, it's not that hard, but it does uh, take a little bit of setup. And so I'm happy to help you do that if that would be a help. And so I just want to encourage you to let's not waste these opportunities. Jesus told us to labor while it's day because the night comes when no man can work. And so as we see all these ridiculous lockdown, uh, all this executive overreach stuff happening, you know, people are hurting even more than ever. And I think that makes them even more open to the gospel. And the gospel that Christ died for our sins and rose again, when you believe that, you get eternal life. That's good news. And, and people, the suicide, the suicide rate is up. People are hurting. The overdose rate is up. The, um, just every bit of pain you can think of is going off the charts. And we, the church, have the answer. Jesus is the answer. We all know that. And I'm so grateful for the ministry of RU and Steve Currington, it was a blessing years back while he was still alive to get to not only hear him speak up in Minnesota uh, and at, in Illinois uh, several times, but got to eat at Fuddruckers, uh, the hamburger place in Illinois uh, with him a couple times. And that kind of passion for the Lord, he, Steve Currington wasn't going to let an obstacle stand in his way. I think it's a great quote to say this, that that those who succeed in life are those who turn stumbling blocks into stepping stones. Satan means COVID for evil, but it could be that God means it for good, like Joseph and his brothers, right? Mentioned that twice. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I'm not going to say COVID's good. I have friends who've passed away from it, friends who are in the hospital right now with it. 
but God can take a bad thing and make it good. And so let's not wring our hands or, or wash our hands of ministry during a time when, when people are hurting and when we're needed the most. <clears throat> With not, withhold not good from them to whom it is due if it is in the power of thine hand to do it. You and I can do so much ministry using social media right now. We can uh, grow our email list. We can, we can interact with people. It's not the same. I know it's not the same. But let's not let it not being the same keep us from doing what we can. We can't do everything, but we can do something. And by God's grace, we will and we can if we're willing to follow what the Word of God says, right? I love the ministry of RU. People are gathering right now. I'm in my office, but people are gathering out, out right now. And I can't wait to go out there and be with them, encourage them, help them, strengthen them. What we've done during uh, this particular time is while no other places are are meeting, we're no longer doing the, the stream every night as a meeting, but we are doing the devotional every morning uh, on Facebook. But uh, what we are doing is streaming our uh, third talk. So we're not streaming first and second talk. It's not everything, but at least it's something. And we're offering to get them you know, the little book so they can start doing challenges. We're finding ways to be creative and do that. And uh, as the, our bus just pulled in and they're unloading right now, it makes me so happy. We have just adapted. We've put the chairs further apart and we're just continuing forward and we're still providing childcare. I'm really happy that we can do this and that we have church people that are willing. Our RU director is willing to come out and do it. And at all of you guys, I just want to commend you. Doing RU on Christmas Day and all these times when you could be doing something else, but instead you're investing your life in ministry. And so I want to encourage you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing. What we've had to do uh, a little bit with Second Talk is we've had people, because we, our, our classrooms are small and we didn't, during the peak of COVID here in Ohio, we adapted for a few weeks and just had somebody share their testimony and have it be interactive so that people could identify with the pain of that person and then and then talk with them, share. Uh, doesn't work in every situation, but we've had to find ways to be creative. I don't advocate that for all time. I'm just saying, if it's don't meet or adapt so you can meet, in our case, that's what we decided to do. And so I'm happy that we've been able to be flexible. And my father-in-law would often say something that I think is powerful, that 90%, my father-in-law, Dr. James Scudder, with the Quentin Road Baptist Church in Illinois, was my mentor for many, many years. And I'm so very grateful. He went to be with the Lord in March of 2020. But he would often say that flexibility is 90% of spirituality. So I think you and I can be flexible. And if we are, that's a way to be spiritual. And so when Satan throws stuff at us, and I have a feeling that our future here in America is going to look different in the next 20 years than it has for the last 20 years. Let's not just say, well, I guess we can't do ministry because it's harder. It's a different environment. The landscape looks different. No, let's use this, this time of adapting to COVID to get really good and find our groove in being flexible. I think something that we should learn to embrace is change. Don't run from change. Change um, is not fun, but let's mentally decide, I'm going to love change. Let's make that decision right now. And if we make that decision, then adapting to do COVID uh, or whatever else happens down the road. Uh, when times get tough, the tough get going. Let's be like that. Look, we have it so good. I, I just saw a video that 400 people in China in the middle of the winter had their homes bu bulldozed by the totalitarian government that doesn't care at all about human rights. We've got it really good. I'm going to go home tonight and I'm going to put my head on my pillow in my house. So while we can do that, let's not, let's not, I've seen so many churches and you have too, and it probably drives you just as crazy as it drives me that they're not even having services. They're using it as an opportunity, I feel like sometimes just to indulge their laziness. Well, let's do less, not more. Well, no, let's be creative. Listen, you guys, I, I commend all of you because all of you believe this. I'm preaching to the choir. We're going to die. So let's die doing God's will. I don't want to die safely in a hole with a mask over my face without COVID. 
I want to die doing what God called me to do. Now, we're not being foolish. We're taking every precaution. We're doing everything we're supposed to do. But all I'm saying is let's not let fear rule our lives. Let's adapt. Let's adapt. And, and, and I don't believe in, in evolution as the origin of the species, but I do believe that you adapt or die. And so let's adapt. Let's take these challenges and say, and, and as we're doing right now, I'm learning from you. Maybe, you, I don't know, but you might be able to learn something from me. Maybe not. But let's learn from each other and let's keep growing. My father-in-law would often, uh, we'd go for a drive together. We'd go maybe into a store and look around. He was always looking for ideas. And everywhere he saw an idea, he would incorporate that into ministry. And that's why he used so many different things. He used food as an outreach. So every Wednesday night, we have a great, big, beautiful uh, quadruple-decker pizza oven. We make pizza for the community. We uh, bought this great, big mixer, and we mix up dough. We can mix 25 pounds of flour and make it into pizza dough. We use that as a food outreach for the community. Every Wednesday night, any donation, they can come in and get a pizza. And it's a great way to get people in the door. So we're adapting. Guys, we're in a rural setting that is so rural, you couldn't even find us on Google Maps to start with. I mean, the building wasn't even on Google Maps. So I don't know where you are in relation to a Walmart, but the nearest Walmart for us is 9.3 miles away. We're at the intersection of two county roads and a dirt road. The county roads are basically like a single lane with a stripe down the middle. But we're finding ways to reach out. I'm using social media ads to get people in for a big event we're having tomorrow. And what's the main focus going to be? Sharing the gospel. I, I will say this. There are, and I'm not tooting my horn at all, there are pastors that would give up in the situation that we're in and say, well, we're too far out. We're going to make excuses. We're just not going to do ministry anymore because there's nobody to minister to. Well, we started our U, and believe it or not, people are coming from all directions. And it's not unusual for us to have 80 or 90 people in a place that is so rural. It shouldn't be working. It shouldn't be working. And I don't know how it's working. It's just the grace of God. Uh, tonight, I think that number is lower. With COVID, it, it goes up and down, and you know how it is with ministry. And so uh, may I also say this, don't compare somebody's highest night to your average night. Let's not let's not do that. I, I look. I don't know how this is working, and I don't know how long it's going to keep working. But I do want to work, and I know you want to work, and I want to be an encouragement to you because you are working so hard, you're doing so good, and God is going to keep using you if you will find ways to keep learning. Let's keep adapting. That's something I certainly learned from my father-in-law. Doctor Scudder would just adapt to every situation. And he would make uh, the most of that situation. He was really good at making the most of the situation. And, and God has used him and grown the ministry of, of the Quentin Road Baptist Church. I, I'm so honored uh, that my brother-in-law there is the pastor. He's such a great guy, and he's also a mentor to me. I continue to learn from him. Let's, let's just keep learning from other people. And I want to learn from you, and, and God will keep using it. So what do we do? We just literally had an iPhone and just went live. And I've learned to be creative with the setting if possible. Um, I've learned to just do it in the car if I need to. Obviously, matters of housekeeping, don't start and stop your broadcast while you're driving because that's against the law. So I don't want to get you in trouble by, you know, by giving you some ideas. Pull over somewhere where it's safe to start and pull over somewhere where it's safe to end. But find ways to be creative and keep reaching out or maybe reach out in person. Uh, in some places, I think you can do that. So we're in the country. It's a whole different environment here, but there are still people that Jesus died for. And so, uh, man, let's just keep using those opportunities. So maybe go talk to your county and see if the stream would work. Is that, I mean, have you done that? Get to know the people uh, that are that are part of your, your county health department or are the, are the addictions folks. Get to know the judges. Go knock on their door. Get to know them. I know every one of the judges in our county. I know uh, most of the staff with Job and Family Services, which is what they call it here. Um, and and I, I know the mayor. Go, I know my state representative, my state senator. Find ways to get to, to be connected with people and then invite them to events so that uh, we, had, we had our state representative who became the Speaker of the House here in Ohio. He came to our opening night for RU. 
but that was only because I tried to create a relationship with him over time as we went forward. Our state senator comes out to different events that we do. Why is that important? Because you want to have a, you want to share the gospel with them. Christ died for politicians too. I know you know that, but it's hard to maybe take those initial steps, but don't be scared to do that. Um, we truly are so remote that if we weren't super creative and always trying to adapt, this church, it's just easy to be out of sight, out of mind, and this church would die. And that may be true of your church as well. I just want to encourage you. I and mean, we had, I mean, there were 15 members, I think, of the church when we came here 11 years ago. And it's not a whole lot bigger now, but it is growing, and we have a preschool and a Christian school. God will see, it's been tough. I've just got to say, and can I tell you, when we were first thinking of coming here, I got biblical counsel, I mean, counsel from my father in law, from other people that I admire and respect, spiritual people. And inside, I was thinking, hey, this is a rocky corner of the flower bed in terms of, you know, being fruitful for ministry. But I felt like God wanted us here, and the counsel that I got said, yeah, go there. So I just said, okay, well, here we go. Let's do it. And they have been, some of them have been very painful years, and probably you can relate to this. I, I've had church meetings where guys threatened me physically. They said, come outside, and let's, they stood up in the meeting and said, let's go outside and solve this like a man. And 30 people would leave at a time. And in a little church, that's really hard, right? You know how hard that is. But by the grace of God, God's given us exactly what we needed, exactly when we needed it. And it was often by talking with other spiritual people. Don't allow yourself to get disconnected in ministry. Don't allow yourself to become isolated because that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to isolate you and destroy you. He wants to isolate your family and destroy them. Ministry is tough. When the, tough, when, when, when the times get tough, the tough get going, how do we get going? It really is like Steve Carrington said. It's the pursuit of that secret inner life with Christ. But it also involves staying connected with other uh, great pastors, uh, with other RU directors, with other uh, people that are walking with the Lord. They're part of the body of Christ. And you weren't meant to go it alone. You aren't a lone ranger. You might be wearing a mask, but, but you're not a lone ranger, okay? Let's not try to do this all on our own because we're going to fall flat on our face. Hey, let's not, let's not burn out. Let's not rust out. I often quote my father-in-law. He said that because he was so right about so many things, and he didn't burn out or rust out, but he kept going strong for the Lord until his very last breath. He was witnessing to the nurses when he was even medicated uh, the last day of his life, and so let's have that kind of a, a, an attitude of, hey, there's going to be all kinds of obstacles. There's going to be people standing in the way. Uh, there's going to be executive overreach and COVID and all this stuff, but let's just find ways to just, God will lead us if we're, if we're sensitive to him. Okay, so uh, we looked at Proverbs 327, withhold not good from them to whom it is due. Guys, we have the only solution in the world. I still haven't figured out what I think about the COVID, COVID vaccine, but I know this, it's not the cure for cancer. Uh, my associate pastor just got uh, successfully, by the grace of God, treated for Hodgkin's lymphoma. He's 25 years old, has a wife and three kids, and God amazingly, miraculously brought him through that treatment time. But if I had the cure for cancer, I would have given it to Pastor Todd. And if I had the cure for cancer, I'd give it to everybody. I don't have the cure for cancer, but I have something far better. You and I, dear friend, have the cure for death. Death, hell, and the grave have been conquered by the one that we are in. We are in Christ. That's my favorite phrase, <clears throat> excuse me, from the New Testament. Because I'm in Christ. I'm declared righteous. And every person can have the joy of the Lord and walk with him and know that their sins are forgiven and be 100% sure they have eternal life by simply trusting that he did that for us. So let's not withhold good from them to whom it is due. The world is due the gospel. We are the ambassadors. Let's not let any, any obstacle stop us. Let's just not let any obstacle stop us. Let's turn back over uh, in Proverbs to the right a little bit, uh, 24 verse 12. 
says, If thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? Look, we can act like we don't see the hurt and the pain of the people around us. You know, looking back in the year 2020, looking back from where, where I'm recording this, more people died last year of drug overdose than died in the Vietnam War in one year in America from drug overdose. Let's not pretend that it's not a problem. We all know it's a problem. Jesus is the answer. And I got to tell you, you and I, the arm of flesh can't do this. The say, uh, when the weakest Christian is on his knees, Satan trembles. This is not about our power. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. I was on the train on the way into Washington, D.C. last Friday with some of the guys from our church to pray in front of the Supreme Court and the Capitol building. And I said, guys, this is not a spirit, this is not a, a war against flesh and blood. I opened up Ephesians and I read that this is a spiritual battle. We're going to win it on our knees, but we're going to work and we're going to pray. I, I had a person in our church decide to stop coming to church because she was going to stay home and pray for uh, our ministry. And, that's, and she said, when the ministry succeeds, it'll be because I've been praying. I think that's incredibly arrogant. And uh, I told her so. And she was offended and I never saw her again. Um, but we aren't supposed to either work or pray. We are to work and pray. So let's pray hard and let's work hard and let's keep adapting and let's keep finding ways that God can use us because he absolutely can. You know, there are new, as you probably know, there are new social media platforms opening up. Um, there's Parler, there's Rumble. So instead of, uh, instead of YouTube, people are using Rumble. Instead of Twitter, people are using Parler. There's probably other ones that I'm not even thinking of right now. But let's not be shy about embracing new ways of getting the gospel out. Because that's what we're called to do. And you know, as believers, our sins have already been forgiven. There's now, let's go for broke. Because now we can just build with wood, hay, and stubble or gold, silver, and precious stones. And so when the times get tough, let's just adapt and keep and give it more gas. Not in the, in the power of the flesh, but in the, in, in the power of the Spirit of God. So let's be led by Him. Let's not do stuff just to do stuff, but let's, let's do what He's calling us to do. Let's remain sensitive to His guidance. But I've seen people that said, well, I'm just waiting to be led by the Lord to what he wants me to do. And 30 years later, I checked back in with them and they're still waiting to be led by the Lord to see what he wants them to do. Sometimes it's just super, super obvious what he wants us to do. I heard Steve Carrington preaching out of the book of James and, and he would often, uh, I've heard him talk about uh, how we are to, um, I'm sorry, Jude, where, where, where we should let we should have a heart of compassion toward people that are perishing, uh, and and of some have compassion, right? Um, and uh, I think I I, I should look that up. I think it might be James, wherever it is. Let's have compassion and snatch people out of the fire. How do we do that? Uh, it's embarrassing as a pastor. I'm not sure where the reference is, but I know that we can't just watch and just act like, well, I don't know they needed help. Every person needs the gospel. The gospel that Christ died for our sins and rose again, they can't get to heaven without trusting that. We have something so much better than the cure for cancer, it's not even funny. And so, I, I know you know that. Be encouraged. Do, do you not have a bus? We didn't have a bus when we came here. Do, do you not have a way to get people here? You can pray and be creative. Can I tell you, the, the greatest solutions that I've often seen are the ones that are born out of necessity. We had to adapt our whole Christmas outreach, as probably you did. We're doing a Christmas luminary hike, an idea I borrowed from a friend. In, in ministry, we call it borrowing, right? We don't call it stealing, which is what it is. <laughs> but, but my wife, who's so much smarter than me, said to me the other day, sometimes it's good to be forced to do something totally differently 
So you have to be creative and build it from the ground up. Well, let's think of those in positive terms, those opportunities, those times. Let's think of those times as instead of, oh man, I have it so bad and now this negative thing happened to me. Let's think of it in positive terms, that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And, and if God uh, brought you to it, he's going to bring you through it. His grace is sufficient for you. His grace is sufficient for me. He's not going to leave you hanging. There's people that are watching, our, they're going to be watching our live stream tonight that have never been to our church. But some of those guys uh, have trusted Christ. Just, be, just by watching the live stream. If we had said, well, we can't do the live stream, it's just too hard, it's, it's, a, it's an interruption in our regular scheduled things that we're doing, well, uh, isn't God going to notice that we had that attitude? And, and I know we can't do everything, but you know, guys, um, I'm 48 years old. I'm a grandpa. I got two little granddaughters. Love them to death. They're so sweet. They're, they're 462 miles away from us. And I'm sure some of you have grandkids overseas, or, or I'm just proud of you. We, we get to see our granddaughters if, uh, several times a year, which is amazing. We love it. But, you know, them being weak isn't an offense to me. Them being weak uh, makes my heart compassionate toward them. God is not mad at you for not doing more. But he, he's for you, as Romans chapter 8 says. God is for you. And he sees the painful time, the times and, and situations in your life. And he's with you and his grace will enable you. What is the tough thing in your ministry that God is just asking you to keep slogging forward and keep being faithful and keep doing the right thing? You know, I... I, I've been young and, and I'm, I'm getting older and I haven't seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. I've also come to realize that if the world gets changed, it's not because I did it. it. It might be changed a tiny bit because I was available to the Lord as a worker together with him, as an ambassador for him. If I was available to him, God will use me and in that little bit of use for this little vapor that we call our lives, God can get the glory. I don't expect that all 7 billion people on the planet are going to trust Christ because I individually share the gospel or, or live streamed or adapted. I don't expect that that'll happen in your case either. But I do believe if all of us are faithfully doing what God calls us to do, and we're not looking at the limitations or we're not looking at the walls that are in front of us, but rather we're looking at the, the God who is so very powerful, who can work miracles, who parted the Red Sea, who created the universe by simply saying, let there be light. That God, the, the, the power that raised Christ up from the dead is going to quicken our mortal bodies. He, he can guide us. He can help us. He can help you. What is it in, in your situation? Do you have an RU program and are you thinking about quitting because it's discouraging and you can't get very many people? Listen, I have a dear friend who's up in Canada who's so brave. He's running an RU program, but he can't get a lot of traction, but yet he's faithful. And he keeps doing it and he's praying. And I believe God is going to reward him as much or greater than somebody that has a huge program with lots of buses. And look, it's not a competition of any sort. It, God, success is faithfulness. So when the times get tough, the tough get going, pursue the heart of God. Say, Lord, I want to be faithful. And I know you're doing that. I just want to encourage you to keep doing that. Don't let these circumstances of life get you down. D don't, don't, don't let Satan get you focused on, on that. Mm. I uh, heard my wife read to me a great devotional from uh, Patch the Pirate's uh, wife, Shelley Hamilton. And her devotional today uh, was Wake Up and Die Right. And so powerful. That message really spoke to me in terms of when the times get tough, the tough get going. Apparently, she was she and her husband, I think, if I understood it right, are, were both doctors uh, in Haiti. 
and she would wake up with her husband and they would teach a class every day, five days a week, every weekday from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. And when uh, Friday came around, it was exam day, and she wrote the exams and people thought the exams were tough, so she uh, so they would they wouldn't come. They called it no man day. Like no man would come to be to be you know to go through this tough test. So she started making a yellow cake every Friday morning, but she had to wake up at 3 a.m. to make the yellow cake so they could start teaching at 4 a.m. till 6 a.m. And after the, she started making the cakes, they never lacked somebody to come to the class. It was always fully attended. And so she adapted in that situation. Instead of just saying, oh, well, uh, I guess we need to quit because they don't want to take exams or, or giving them a tongue lashing, which we have some politicians that are really good at blaming all of us people for simply breathing air, right? And the more, you know, the beatings will continue until morale improves, right? Instead of having that attitude, she said, okay, I'm gonna adapt and I'm gonna make it a positive. And it worked. And I was so impressed to see that. And uh, then, I mean, uh, to read the rest, or my wife read the rest of this to me, and I was just amazed at what she did. She homeschooled her kids then from 8 to 12, and then got on a bicycle and rode uh, 90 minutes to two hours to somebody that wanted to study the Bible anywhere. She'd go anywhere. And then she'd come back and make dinner. And then... Um, They'd turn their generator off at nine o'clock at night and she'd write encouraging notes to people. And, and I'm just blown away by a person with that much devotion. I can't even remember her name, but her faithfulness was an inspiration. And anybody that came to their house hungry, they would feed. And anybody that came and had a medical need, they would treat them. Like, I don't even know her name, but she's an inspiration to me. Somebody knowing your name isn't the point. Now, all I'm saying about me being a grandpa is that I've just learned, I, mean, I had such big dreams. I wanted to go be used by God to change the world. Instead, I'm in the middle of nowhere, Ohio. But God is bringing, he brought people in here tonight and they're hearing the gospel and they're growing. And so wherever you are, it doesn't matter if there's only one person that, you're, that God is using you to reach, you're making a difference in the world. So let's be faithful. And yes, I think technology is a great way to reach out. I'm not a fan of big tech at all because I think they're doing evil things. And I think the heads of these uh, big tech companies, these CEOs, some of them I think are just evil people. But let's. You, my father-in-law was on TBN for a long time. He was on WGN, a secular outreach as a Baptist preacher, because he wanted the world to hear the gospel. And many, I have talked to hundreds, I've literally talked to thousands of people from around the nation. In the years that I answered the phone, they would call in, we'd give away heaven tracks or something, they'd call in for the 50 free tracks, and I'd get their information, we'd send them tracks, but then I'd get to ask them if they knew for sure they had eternal life. Are you 100%, what percentage chance do you have of making it to heaven? And they would I say they're you know they're not a hundred percent sure, and so I'd get to ask them questions uh, and and share the gospel clearly and simply, and, and I just want to say I learned to do that at Dayspring Bible College and at the Quentin Road Baptist Church. Do you have a good mentor that will teach you how to be effective and adapt in your circumstances? I'll just tell you, ministering in this small rural community is a whole different thing than ministering in Lake Zurich. I was mentored in a white collar Chicago area and now I'm doing ministry in a blue collar rural Ohio area, but people still need Jesus and faithfulness is God's measure of success. So whatever God has called you to do, don't let the obstacles thwart you like the children of Israel, the 10 spies got all weak in the knees when they saw the thickness of the walls uh, in Canaan and they saw the height of the giants and they, they forgot God and they stared at their circumstances and staring, instead of staring at God. Whatever you're facing, dear friend, face, face it with the Lord. My sister-in-law, after my brother died on life support, they, uh, she made the decision to remove the life support and, uh, and he died. 
and I helped her I helped her sell my brother's tree trimming business in Chappaqua, New York. And ultimately, she wound up moving back with us to uh, Wakanda, Illinois, to our house with her 11-month-old son. And my sister-in-law, Anna, trusted Christ as a result of living with our family for about six months. She's now back in Slovakia, where she's originally from. But I'm so honored that we got to have that time with her. She trusted Christ because of that situation. When the times get tough, the tough get going. Don't let your circumstances stop you from serving the Lord.